how many of you know the Hebrew word without looking up on your computer? Uh, I, I'm not just saying it to you. I mean, if anybody else had a computer, it would be for them too. But you just happen to be the only one. Uh, but uh, the Hebrew word for ground? Close. Well, that's, that's close to the English word for ground. Um, what about the, uh, the Hebrew word for um, male? Like is it male versus female? What about the Hebrew word for female? When he saw Eve. Eve means living, right? So when he saw Eve, though, he didn't call her Eve. He gave her a different name. He called her, yeah, we translate it woman, right? So he, he called her, yeah, so his name for her was woman, right? He didn't call her Eve. Uh, his name for her was woman. Uh, and so what, uh, anybody remember what that word is? Uh, okay, anybody remember what the word for mankind is? Mankind. The Hebrew, the Hebrew word for mankind, this one I know you know. It's already been said in class. Charles said it like 30 seconds ago. Adam. Okay. So Adam, Adam is a personal name, right? But it is also the Hebrew word for mankind, right? So Adam, you know, and so this is, you know, when they're translating in the beginning of Genesis, I mean, you know, it's, this, there, there becomes some question as to are all of these references to Adam references to the individual Adam or are they references to mankind because it's the same word, right? So the, the word for mankind, man, um, and not male, we're not talking about male, female. When I say man, it means like, so I'm saying mankind, it's actually the word man is how it's translated, but I'm using mankind so that you don't think when I say man that I'm talking about male. So mankind, just humans in general, is Adam, right? Um, and so uh, in Genesis, we kind of go back, there's, there's some references where it seems like he's talking about mankind, but then most of them are the, the personal pronoun. But it's, it's hard to, to know because it's the same word. Because we got the name from mankind from the first man. right? Um, and then male is I-S. Is I-S. Is is. So this is the Hebrew word for male. Right? Yeah, exactly. Adam was pulled out of the ground, right? And so the Hebrew word for ground is Adama. So Adam was pulled out of the Adama, right? Yeah, exactly. I have that on tape. I can go back and listen to it. All right. Eve was pulled out of man. He says, from this is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. And so I almost feel like he knew that the word for ground was Adama, and God called him Adam because he was pulled out of the Adama. And Eve is pulled out of him, and so he calls Eve Isa, woman. And we even kind of still capture that in English, where you have man and woman, that it is, captures part of the name of man, even in the word woman. And so this is, is how it goes. Um, and so this kind of an interesting... Um, and then the other interesting thing is that these these are the type of A that that is can mean either female which it, it might mean that you know but it, it could have a double meaning because also when you use this A it could mean two in Hebrew like towards um, so you put that A ending at the end it could mean towards and so um, so the double meaning of that then, kind of the other side meaning might be Adam back to the ground, right, towards the ground, 
male towards the female. The Bible says, for this reason, a man will leave his wife and cleave to a bride. You know, so anyway, this is kind of a side image of, of Adam uh, returning to the ground and man uh, returning and looking after wife. So anyway, so that's kind of some interesting things to show um, kind of the, and then Aries doesn't have anything to do with this, but Aries is land. And it can mean either land or earth. So remember we talked about some of the prophecies um, don't quite, it's hard to specify whether they're saying the land as in a small area of land or the earth as in the entire earth because Aries is the same word for both. So sometimes it's, when it talks about the earth or the land, it's hard to, um, to differentiate unless the context is very clear what it's meaning. So this is where some people try and start the, the idea of was the flood a global flood or not because it says it covered the whole Aries, which would still be the same word if it was just the local area of Palestine versus the entire world. But the context makes it clear that he's talking about the whole earth because everyone was killed um, from this. Um, but so anyway, so a lot of the prophecies and things, it can be it can be a challenge to know was he was the author talking about the whole earth or the land as in the promised land or something like that, um, and then so that's our devotional. I want to talk today. Uh, Oh, and then there's one other part that I didn't throw in there about that, that I, that I thought about right at the last minute, so I wrote it in. Because reading this this morning about, I, I, I'm in Genesis, I was reading it, and, and it says that, uh, that no suitable helper was found for Adam, right? Uh, and so, you know, and then Eve is, is produced, and so she is the helper, but the question is, what is she helping in, right? So it, it is... It is helping with the workload too, I'm sure, but it is uh, it's just kind of interesting. He says it's not good for man to be alone, and so he created Eve. So it wasn't, I don't think, just the companionship of Adam and Eve. It was the ability to reproduce that was also given. So that, you know, all of the kids and all of mankind um, would be able to be produced because God created Eve. Uh, so anyway, it's just kind of interesting that, that God created a helper for Adam, and through the helper, uh, Adam was reproduced all across the world, right? You know, that, that they multiplied. The reason I think that's interesting is because Jesus, the second Adam, says that if I go away, I'll send the helper, right? He talks about sending the helper. He says comforter in John and, and helper kind of back and forth almost interchangeably. And he says, I'll send the helper, um, in the second helper. And so it's kind of interesting um, that Eve was described as the helper in Genesis to Adam, and her main way of helping was through reproduction, right? Through reproducing. And so uh, I just think it's kind of an interesting picture of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is given as a helper, and it is through the Holy Spirit that Christ is now reproduced in all of his children by the Spirit. Um, we, are, we are given birth to by the Spirit. And so it's kind of interesting that Christ is the second Adam. He says the Holy Spirit is the helper. And it's just interesting now that, that, that Christ is not here and he has sent the Spirit, that that is when the multiplication of the church took place. So just like when Eve shows up, that is when the multiplication of humanity comes. Jesus says, I will send the helper. And then out of that, the church exploded. He says, wait here until you've received uh, your help from on high. And then after that, the church multiplied, right? So this is kind of interesting picture there um, of the helper. All right. So we talked last week about grace. Uh, talked even more about grace, but none of you have heard it yet. So when you go back in and watch the video, there's uh, other things on grace. But one of the ideas um, that, I, that I didn't really cover in the video, but th that's important for just understanding that whole concept of grace is that a lot of times in the Old Testament, it was about them trying to show their love to God, as opposed to grace is about understanding God's love towards you. All right? So Paul says, I pray, you know, above all things, that you have power to comprehend the depth and width and height and length of his love. Right? 
Um, and then he, in Ephesians, he goes on to say that, that that is where the real power of the ministry comes, is from understanding how much Christ loves you. Right? And so really, that's the heart of grace, is not us seeking to earn his favor, but it is an understanding of how much he loves us and what he has done for us. And so, uh, so today's uh, theology topic would be sonship. I'm going to talk about this. So when we talk about sonship, right, being a son adopted into the kingdom, you know, it is a, it, first of all, it's position, it's not gender, right? So when the, when the Bible talks about sonship, it is, it is uh, talking about your position with the Father, not so much a gender thing. So women are referred to in the Bible in the same discussions of sonship because really it's about um, your position in Christ, that we are in Christ, He is the Son, and so we have the same inheritance that Christ has, um, and so we are adopted in. And so when the Bible talks about sonship, it is not excluding women, it's just talking about the position that we are all in now through Christ, right? So, uh, so that's the first thing, that sonship is not just about guys, it's, it's for anyone in the kingdom. Um, and so I think there's some interesting scriptures that I want us to look at, because the whole idea of this class is to take a, a topic and think through its implications uh, for us, and then how, if we understood it more clearly, how it might affect how we, uh, you know, how we live and that kind of thing, right? Applied theology. So sonship, I think, is a huge topic that if we understood this more clearly, um, it would help us to, uh, to understand what Christ is trying to do in us for maturity and things like that. So let me start by talking about uh, the, the Jewish kind of, the, the coming of age ceremonies, right? Um, so what's, what's one of the things in the Old Testament um, that, uh, that every son had to go through, right in the very beginning? Circumcision, Circumcision right? That one was really um, associated with birth and being part of the covenant people, right? With circumcision. And then the second one happens right around 12 years old. Bar Mitzvah. And then the third one? It's, it's not married. Um, although if you got married, it would, it would be you know, a separate ceremony. But... Um, Kind of the education. Well, the education for doing what the father's work was, right? So whatever that your household thing. You know, I mean, a lot of times if your dad was a blacksmith, then you would be at a blacksmith. It was a form of apprenticeship. Would come between the second and the third one. So you wouldn't do apprenticeship before twelve. And so that's really at twelve years old you started that kind of stuff. Like you wouldn't be working doing your dad's business before that. But at about twelve, then you would start doing. It. Which is, when Christ is 12, what does the Bible say? He sneaks off into the temple and she says, why are you here and not with us? He says, don't you know I have to be about my father's business, right? And so, so that happens at 12. And so from 12 to this next one is really just apprenticeship, right? Um, learning the skills of whatever the father's business was until you hit this age and then you were considered... Um, like a full son, right, at that point, right, that you could then take on the father's responsibility, right? Yeah, you could run the father's business for him at that point. It, it happens at age 30. And I'll spell it out. It's H-U-I-O-S. This is the name of, of a son, right? This, this right here, that is the name... Uh, of a of the, this full son that we're talking about, but the ceremony itself um, is this. So that's uh, H U I O. That's a T. H E S I A. Huathesia, I guess is how you pronounce that. Huathesia. 
and it comes from that huios, meaning son. Uh, and so this is the 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 sonship, which is what we're talking about, the the full sonship, right? And so we know that these were the two important ages then that are mentioned for Jesus, right? That uh, he is. We have that scene at 12 that's kind of weird where he says, I'm supposed to be about my father's business. But he relents and goes back with them and travels with them some more, right? And then at age 30, he is um, baptized, right? In the Jordan River at age 30. Okay? And he becomes full son, right? The, the, from what I'm able to learn about this ceremony, um, and... And granted, I, I don't know that any of this is coming off of ancient manuscripts, so I don't know if this is retroactive, like what I'm about to tell you. Like, because of what Christ happened with Christ, they started doing this, or if this was something they were doing before Christ. Um, I, I, I believe it's, it's the latter, that, that they were doing this before Christ, and so that's what, why it happened in the Lord Jesus' story as well. Um, but the ceremony is that after these roughly 17 years of working with your father, 17 to 18 years of working with your father, learning how to do the family business, um, it, then at this point he feels like he can trust you now, right? That, that you've gone through all of the, the ups and downs of adolescence. You're about 30 years old. You are now trustworthy that he can trust you to operate the business in the same way that he would, right? And so they would do this ceremony where they have the celebration and the party and all of that. And part of it is that he would bless his son by putting his hand on his uh, head. And he would say, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Right? And then from that point, it was a transference of authority that from here on out, he wasn't just a child, he was a son. Right? That word, huios, because there's a different word. I think it's uh, to tech. Tech on, I think something like that is is a regular just child like somebody you know you, you have a kid that's born, that's this. Huyos is kind of that that uh, that sonship that is is more the maturity of a son, right? Not just the fact that you were born to him, but you are a trustworthy son, a huyos. Um, and so it's interesting then that that's what we see. At the, at the Jordan River, it, when Jesus is 30, and, you know, he's baptized, and the Father, the Spirit comes on him, right, which is like the hand of the Father, and he says, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, right? Um, and then from then on out, Jesus begins his ministry on behalf of the Father, right? And so in, in that culture, so like I said, I don't know if this is something that was started because of Jesus' story, or if this was, I, my understanding is that this was going on in Jewish culture before Jesus' time. And part of it is that they would clothe themselves with a, with a different clothing, which might also go back to what was going on with, with Jacob and Joseph. Um, that, that here, Jacob at, at 12 is being prepared for this, and so his father gives him the coat of many colors, because part of being the huyos, the huyos was not just a child or a son who was a child, it was... It was a son who was going to take over the father's herds, who was going to take over the father's business, who the father was entrusting the responsibility of the inheritance to. And so you could have other sons, but they weren't all huyos, you know. And so that could have been part of what was going on here when Joseph is a young man and his father gives him the coat of many colors. Then all of a sudden the brothers are jealous because they know what that means, that he is going to be the one that inherits everything. Uh, and so... Uh, but so anyways, it's kind of interesting with, with, with the Lord that we see uh, these two things there. And so, and at this point then, the son uh, has the authority to operate on behalf of the father, right, in all of his business things. And so, uh, the, the neat thing about this, let's go to uh, John chapter 1. the Gospel of John. Let 
And so hopefully after this lesson, you will go back through and think about this concept perhaps a little more. So we'll touch on it today, and maybe this will stir up some thinking about what does it mean for us to be a son. Because what we're going to look at is several scriptures that talk about us walking in sonship. And it doesn't just mean uh, you know, that we're born. It means the trustworthy son who, uh, who has been trained by his father and can now be trusted with responsibility. Right? And so what we'll see is it starts, and, and John's is actually talking about this. Paul starts talking about this quite a bit. So the one we're going to read in John is actually this one, and it's talking about the new birth. So you'll see a lot of huios. Anytime they're talking about Jesus as the son, it only uses huios. When it talks about us as being sons, it uses both, right? Almost as though when we're born into the kingdom, we're, we're a child, but not necessarily someone that God will trust with responsibility yet, right? And so Jesus was only referenced as this. But, but for us, we have opportunities where we're, we're born, we're part of the kingdom, we've been born anew, but, but even in your own life, you can see that when you were first saved, verse the maturing of the Lord, that there comes a place when the Lord can trust you more later than when you were first saved. And it's kind of this concept where the, the father begins to teach for many years before uh, he would entrust them with responsibility. And we see this quite a bit when somebody's saved. Sometimes the first 10 years of their life, the Holy Spirit, of their new life, the Holy Spirit is training them, getting them to to walk away from old habits and old lifestyles and teaching them the word and preparing them for what he has at this stage when he calls them into some kind of ministry or something. Uh, so John chapter 1, we'll start in verse uh, chapter 12, verse 12 rather, of chapter 1. Chapter 1, verse 12. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name. This is talking about Jesus, right? This is John's the opening dialogue about what Jesus' ministry was. It says, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Tekon. Right? To become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So this is talking about the new birth. right? So he's saying... That all who believe on Jesus are tekon. They're children of God. Right. Later, when Paul starts to talk about um, the manifestation of the sons of God, it's this. Right. And so what Paul is saying is, there's a difference between being a child of God and being a son of God. Right. Uh, and so it is that, that concept there. Um, a couple of things in this verse that I think is interesting. It says, to all who believed on him, he gave the right to become tekon of God, children of God, the right. I think that's an interesting word to use. Not just the power, and not just to say that anyone who believed on him became children of God. He says anyone who believed on him was given the right to become a tekon of God, uh, which is kind of an interesting thing. First of all, it means it's a right. It's something that he has given to you. You have the right to this, and no one can take it from you. Right? It is your right. Uh, but in some ways, it also it seems to imply that uh, uh, that there is a choice there. Right? That, that you need to want to be a child of God. Right? And then the other thing um, is it says that all who believe in his name, he gave the right to become a tech on of God. So I think that's kind of an interesting thing. If I was to go back and do some devotions on my own to think about how I could apply that, is that he uses the word become, right? That it is a becoming uh, process, but, and I think that's something for all of us, you know, that we are, uh, that there is a change that takes place, right? That we, we were once not part of the kingdom, but now we have the right to be children of God, to become that. It's, some, it's a change that takes place. It's not just a, you know, uh, you know, a, a church service, or it's not just a, a a thing that happens outside of you, or it's not just a belief. But I mean, it's it's a becoming, I guess, is what I'm trying to get at. That word "become" means that something happens, right? That you have become this now. Uh, 
Yeah. Wait, it's it's Yeah, and then the other, well, since you bring up the word adopted, um, that's what this is, is it means adopted. Who sees you, the whole thing. Okay. It's, it's your adoption ceremony. The reason that doesn't make sense is because we don't really have a good English word to capture what they mean by that. And so they use the word adopted. But when we hear adopted, we think of someone who is just, you know, like the legal proceeding of, okay, this child was born to somebody else, we're going to adopt them into the family, now they're part of the family. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, and so I think what he's getting at is when he says that we have been uh, adopted in, uh, that there is this new birth, but, but whenever Paul is using this, that ancient Jewish and Greek minds, the Greeks had this too, that adoption at this 30-age ceremony, 30-year-old ceremony, it was called your adoption ceremony, right? Whether, but it was most of the time it was from your real father, you know, it's just that everybody went through that. And it was called adoption because this is not adopted like what we think of in terms of this person wasn't part of my family and now they are. It's, it means really like investor with responsibility, that you are now in the place of being a honored son here that I can trust, right? And so I think we lose a lot of what Paul is trying to say because when we think adopted, we just think that we are part of the family now. When he is making a reference to being uh, a trustworthy, mature, fully vested, given responsibility, right? And so, uh, so when you hear that word adopted, it doesn't just mean that you are now part of the family, because really, uh, tech on makes you part of the family, right? When you are, when you are given the new birth, right? Um, but there is a lot of references in Paul where he's talking about adoption, and it is this coming to maturity of the believer, right? And that's really what he's talking about, but it doesn't convey well into English. And so, uh, so they've used the word adopted all the way through, but in today's culture, adopted, it's, it's not that this was completely wrong when they first started translating it that way, as much as it is that in today's culture, the word adopted has begun to take on this whole, it's an industry now, I mean, it's, you know, it's, and it's, it's kind of taken a life of its own, what we think of as adopted. And that has diverged from this kind of original thought of you have been, you are my child, but now you have been adopted into a place of responsibility, right? Yeah. Yeah. Carrying a cloak in the Jewish tradition, mm -hmm. does that take away the... Are you, I'm, I'm not sure what you mean when you say like, like when they were upset and they would carry their clothes? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure. Because um, I, I don't know how, what the legal ways that they would use it. I know when they were upset, they would rip their clothes. Sometimes they'd put ashes on their head. Um, so I, I guess it's possible that it could um, to symbolize that you've been, yeah, that, that they do, yeah. And so what they mean by that is. But I wonder which Right, that's what I'm getting, yeah. Because they know that they're still their child by birth. So would it be that one? But when they say, you're no longer my son, it's, I, you're no longer the one that I can trust, that I can lean on, that I can give responsibility, that I can pour into. Yeah. You, you have lost your position. You're no, you're not, it's not that you're not blood to me anymore. You have lost your position in this family. Right? Uh, and so I think this is an important concept for us. Um, Interestingly enough, when Paul was, um, saw the light, do you remember what, uh, what happened to him? It's, it's in Galatians, right? So he, he sees the light, and in Galatians is where he kind of recounts his testimony from the early years. And it says that he, 
spent, uh, I want to say, th three years in Damascus, ministering there, learning, right? We don't have any letters to Damascus, no major churches that we know of, although he might have done some really good things, but he was, he was ministering there, but it wasn't the more famous ministry that we know of later where he's writing the, the, the works of, you know, all of the different books of the Bible, and he's going on these missions with Silas and Barnabas. And then it says he goes to Arabia for 14 years. So that is a 17-year window where he is trained by the Lord before he is turned over to his full-time ministry that we see of in the, the life of Paul. It's just kind of interesting that that is the same time period between, between the bar mitzvah and the adoption ceremony, that 17-year period of training before you're turned off to your real ministry. Did I see a hand? What yep. I'm pretty sure, let me think, I, I want to say he was, I want to say he was 30 and he reigned for 40 years. I, I, I believe that's, I believe that's what it was. Um, and so, so that might be the same time period of David's wanderings. Because the concept is, okay, here's where we're going to really start with you, right? And you're not ready yet though, right? We see that in, 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 uh, in David's life. He's anointed, but he's not ready, you know? And so God... God tells him, okay, you know, you're, uh, I've got a calling for you. And God begins to introduce him to the calling. And then he goes through a period of, of hardship and trial where the Lord is, is training him for what he's going to need at this stage. And so he's running from Saul. He's being uh, attacked. He's having to hide. He's having to be a leader. He's having to learn how to fight one-on-one um, -on -one, all by himself. He's learning all these things that it will take to be a leader. And then, um, and then God uh, then releases him to it, right? Um, so I think I think there's something to that, and I think that you know if we, if we were to look at that in our own life, it may not correlate to these same ages, but I think the principle of God saying, "Okay, now you're ready to start your training process," and it taking 14 to 17 years of God really preparing, it doesn't mean you're not ministering during that time. It means your ministry during that time is as much about preparing you as it is about the people you're helping, right? And then the Lord begins often in somebody's life to begin to open up other doors where they begin to do it if they will mature. And so I think this is the idea that Paul is talking about when he's talking about some of these concepts of sonship is that, that we are all children of God, but what we want to become is people that the Lord can trust, that we have been faithful to the Lord, so that, that through our times of trial, we didn't turn our back on the Lord, that we were consistent, we were faithful, we learned, and we were obedient. And so when the opportunity came, then we were ready for whatever it is that the Lord wants us to do. Right? <music>